uh, ladies, I am Sherelle Warren, your teaching leader for this class. We have a few announcements. Uh, let's see, the Matthew uh, Parables mini-series is going to be the, the, for two weeks. The series actually starts next Tuesday. Please invite your friends. That's December the 14th, which is our last class of the year. The second uh, part of the parable mini-series will be our first class of the new year, which is on January the 11th. And uh, that parable uh, mini-series will cover lessons 13 and 14. All right. And then uh, the my BSF uh, 2.0 will actually open tomorrow. But the lecture will be available today on the YouTube channel. But after tomorrow, you can get the lecture not only on the YouTube channel, but you can continue to get them just like you did before on the uh, BSF, my BSF website. Okay, ladies? And when you log in, just a reminder, your uh, group leader uh, can uh, help you or get help for you. But you want to use the email address that you use to set up your MyBSF account and then your password. And if you don't remember your password, then just click on Forgot Password and it'll send you a verification code in order to uh, set a new password, okay? And then thank you, uh, uh, thank you for considering BSF for your end of year giving. Contributions can be made in uh, class through next Tuesday the 14th or online, okay? And it gives you the online link. Okay, and there's the outline, and it'll be there for a few minutes. Okay, ladies, I'm going to pray, and you all pray as well. Heavenly Father, just thank you uh, for today, Lord. I thank you that uh, we don't have to be perfect, Heavenly Father, because your son Jesus is perfect. And so, Lord, I thank you uh, that our sins... Uh, can be forgiven uh, and have been forgiven, Lord. We can trust and believe in your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, Lord. Let any of those that have unbelief today, that they would receive clarity, Lord, and the pricking of your, of uh, the Holy Spirit, that they would uh, believe in you and come to know you, and they would be certain, and they would not waver in their faith with you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you have done and all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, ladies. So, how many choices have you made today? For most of us, we made the choice to attend our BSF class. Uh, we made the choice on uh, who we would sit next to today. We made the choice on whether or not we would smile today when we uh, came in and when we sat next to that person. Uh, there are uh, many choices that we make in our life, and we live in a world of choices. But much more important um, than the choices of whether you would smile, who you would sit, sit next to, your hairstyle, or or whatever choices you would make, do you choose to trust Jesus or not? That is the choice that we're talking about today. What I hope we learn today is that the truth about Jesus leads some people to believe in him while others refuse to believe. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11, verse 1, and the Bible is true. Amen. Jesus comforted John the Baptist in verses 1 through 15. Remember, John the Baptist, before his birth, God had chosen him to get the world ready for Jesus. John preached that people should repent and be baptized. But now, this faith-filled hero was in prison. Things had not gone the way John expected. Had he misunderstood God's voice like other prophets before him? John expected the Messiah to save Israel from its enemies and rule in Jerusalem as their king. Jesus was not doing this. 
Did that mean Jesus was just a prophet and a good man and not the son of God? Even John struggled with doubt about who Jesus truly is. So John sent his disciples straight to Jesus for answers. He asked, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus loved John. He told John's followers to tell John about his miracles. The blind saw, the lame walked, the leopards were cleansed, the deaf heard, the dead were raised, and the good news was proclaimed to the poor. These miracles proved that Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah. Jesus turned to the crowd around him and praised John's faith and work. Jesus said that John was the greatest of all prophets. As Lisa said yesterday in leaders meeting, she said he was the goat. All right. As John taught about repentance, he got people ready to believe in Jesus. The only one who can save people from their sins. Jesus welcomes our questions. He will never be offended by them. He will help us overcome our unbelief. All our questions may not be answered immediately, but we can trust his timing. John was not delivered from prison, but Jesus encouraged him and straightened his faith and strengthened his faith. Our questions are an opportunity for us to be rooted in Jesus and cement our faith and not an excuse to slip into unbelief. Jesus condemned unbelievers in verses 16 through 24. We may think if we had seen Jesus perform a miracle, I definitely would have believed in him. But sadly, many people did not. Some of Jesus' listeners were critical to him. Jesus said they were like spoiled children who demanded their own way and then stay unhappy. The same people who complained about John living in the wilderness complained about Jesus' friendship with sinners. They did not think Jesus was God. Jesus condemned these unbelieving people who rejected the truth. Condemnation means being judged by God as being guilty of sin. Some of Jesus' other listeners were indifferent to him. They just didn't care. These people didn't attack Jesus or drive him away. They simply ignored the miracles and his call to repent. Jesus said that the people who had seen his work but did not repent would receive a bigger punishment than wicked cities of the Old Testament. Jesus compares the judge pagan cities with the cities he ministered to. Tyra, I'm I'm apologizing now, and Sidon, Sodom, were Gentile cities filled with pagan people who were often condemned by the Old Testament prophets for worship of Baal or Baal, and for their pride in their power and wealth. Sodom is an immoral city of sin. If these cities would have witnessed Jesus' works, they would have repented and responded in belief. Whereas Chorazin, Bethsaida, And Capernaum witnessed many miracles, yet in their pride, they did not repent nor put their faith in Jesus. Rather, they were indifferent to Jesus. So, Jesus condemns them with judgment. The message of Jesus demands a response. The right response, acknowledging our sins and repenting from our ways and surrendering to God. Our response to Jesus has eternal consequences. If we respond in belief, we enter his kingdom and will live with him forever. 
if we respond in unbelief, we will forever be full of self in absence of God and eternity in hell. In verses 25 through 27, we see Jesus in prayer to his Father. I'll read to you verses 25 through 30. Rest for the weary. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank God for the word. Mm. Jesus praised God because He allows even little children to know and understand who Jesus is. Salvation is not for the strong or for those who think they earn their place with God. Salvation is an unearned gift given only through Jesus Christ. And this salvation comes only through his son, Jesus. Jesus called the tired in verses 28 through 30. Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. He talked about something called a yoke. In his day, when there was a big load to carry, my, my, a man would buy oxen to help with the work. He would put a wooden contraption called a yoke over the necks of two oxen to connect them so they could walk side by side and pull a heavy load together. Jesus tells us to take his yoke. When we connect ourselves to him and learn from him, he takes the weight of our troubles and makes them light for us. Then we can find rest. Our first principle. People who believe in Jesus find refuge, but people who do not believe await judgment. People who believe in Jesus find refuge, but people who do not believe await judgment. There may be times we go through different circumstances which might cause us to question or make us too critical or indifferent to Jesus. Our circumstances may change, our emotions may rise and fall, but the God we serve is faithful. He does not change like us. From the beginning, God has had a plan to restore the world that sin broke, and God is faithful to his own plan. One of God's attributes is faithful. We know God is faithful because he sent his son to the cross to keep his promises. And that son, Jesus, calls people to come to him. We can come to him with any questions we have. He will not judge us. Rather, he builds our faith with kindness and patience. Let's learn to repent from our critical attitudes and indifference. If you are struggling to accept the message of Jesus, I urge you to bring your questions and doubts to Jesus. Ask him to help you overcome your unbelief. He calls people who know they need him and people who don't know they need him. 
He calls us to learn from him, and he promises the very best kind of rest, the soul kind that we really need. Now, in chapter 12, Jesus confronted hostile people. We see Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath in verses 1 through 21. But people, we, um, but before we dive in, remember, we learned in Genesis, what we studied last year, that after six days of creating the universe and everything in it, God rest on the Sabbath day. The seventh day is also called the Sabbath. So God created the Sabbath as a day for rest and worship. One Sabbath day, Jesus and his disciples walked through the grain fields. His disciples were hungry and picked some of the grain to eat. Eating grain picked from someone else's field was allowed under their law. However, the watching Pharisees complained to Jesus that his disciples had broken their Sabbath laws. No one was supposed to to work on the Sabbath. And they said picking grain and preparing food was work. Jesus reminded the Pharisees about their greatest king, David. David ate the holy bread of the temple while Saul was chasing him and trying to kill him. Jesus also explained that priests who worked in the temple on the Sabbath did nothing wrong. He said, he is greater than the temple. The Pharisees did not understand that. If it was okay to work in the temple on the Sabbath, it was more than okay to work with Jesus' presence on the Sabbath. Before moving on, Jesus declared that he is Lord of the Sabbath. To emphasize this, Jesus healed a man's shriveled hand the very same day. Instead of learning from Jesus' words in the grain fields and being happy about the man's healed hand, the Pharisees decided to kill Jesus. Jesus knew what they were planning, so he left the area. Many people followed him. Jesus healed them and told them not to tell who he was. Next, we see Jesus healing a demon-possessed man in verses 22 through 37. Some people brought Jesus a man who was possessed by a demon and could not see or speak. Jesus healed him, and the people were amazed. They asked if Jesus could be the son of David, the Messiah, but the Pharisees were not impressed. Instead of praising him, they said that Jesus cast out demons through Satan's power, not, God, not, not God's. Jesus responded logically. Satan would not want to drive out his own demons. Jesus showed very clearly that he is God and has power over Satan. Jesus declared that because the Pharisees were not with him, they were against him. If someone is against Jesus, they are against God. Jesus spoke about blasphemy, which is speech that dishonors God. The Pharisees have called God's work evil, which is a very serious sin. He said, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. If a person's heart is full of evil and sin, they will speak evil and sinful things. And one day God will hold them accountable for their words. Satan fueled growing opposition to Jesus and his message that would eventually end in his death on the cross. When Jesus healed a man, on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders plotted how they might kill him. When Jesus cast out a demon out of a man, the Jewish leaders attributed Jesus' miracles to Satan. Satan 
was an angel who led a rebellion against God and took a host of demons with him. They now oppose God's mission, his message, and his people. At the cross, Jesus defeated Satan in his victory over sin. Though he is a defeated foe, Satan still prowls the earth, seeking to kill, steal, and destroy. When Christ returns to set up his eternal kingdom, Satan and his demons will be forever banished to everlasting punishment. Satan knows this and seeks to wreak havoc during his limited time and domain on earth. Satan's influence is limited by God, who is stronger than Satan. Read Job 1, six, uh, chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. Unlike God, Satan is not omniscient, omnipotent. Help me, ladies. Omnipotent. I worked on that, but God is good, and I appreciate your help. Amen. I'm not sure what I said during doctrine uh, talk on yesterday. My late my leaders probably heard omnipotent. I apologize. <laughs> we had a lot going on. Amen. Oh, or omnipresent. Believers should recognize the truth about Satan and be aware of his deception and opposition. But while we understand Satan's ploys, our greater focus remains on God. Amen. Whose power and purposes cannot be stopped by Satan. So let's make it personal. When I do not believe in Satan or understand his agenda, I cannot explain the evil in the world. I am not alert to the deception and distractions he and his forces use to take my eyes off of God and truth. When I believe in the reality of Satan, I remain alert and watchful. And I am not surprised when I encounter opposition to God's work. And while Satan's agenda could discourage me, I fix my eyes and thoughts on the unstoppable purposes of God and his mighty power. I stand strong in the Lord and pray for his wisdom and strength to remain steadfast and obedient to God. Do not be surprised when God's work in you and your work for God is opposed. Are you ever surprised that doing the right thing and serving God meets so many unexpected challenges. Satan and his demons try to discourage and entangle believers to draw them away from God's purposes. Satan's tactics involve lying and opposing truth, both in subtle and direct ways. Fill your mind with the truth and depend on the Holy Spirit to, for the power you need to preserve and persevere. Stay alert to Satan, Satan's tactics, but keep your focus on God. Keep your eyes on Jesus. How does thinking about Scripture and studying God's Word help you recognize and overcome Satan's lies. The best defense against Satan is to be grounded with God's truth. God wins your battle with, with sin, Satan, and evil is temporary, and God's victory is certain. There is no reason to expect defeat now or ever. God is stronger than your foe. Will you keep your eyes on God and the victory Christ has won? In verses 38 through 45, instead of repenting and believing Jesus, the Pharisees wanted yet another sign 
from him to prove who he was. Would one more sign make them believe, though? Jesus refused to give them another sign and pointed them instead to the sign of Jonah. He compared his coming death and resurrection to Jonah, the Old Testament prophet who was swallowed by a giant fish. When the fish spit Jonah back out after three days, he went to the wicked city of Nineveh and led the people there to repent. Jesus would die on a cross and be in a grave for three days before coming alive again. This would be the great miracle that saves people from their sins. People like us. Now, in verses 46 through 50, we'll take a look at Jesus and his true family. I'm going to read to you verses 46 through 49, ladies. Jesus' mother and brothers. While Jesus was still uh, talking to the crowds, his mother and brother stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who is my mother and who is my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. While Jesus was talking, his mother and brothers arrived to speak with him. He used their arrival to teach that those who do his father's will to believe in his son whom he sent are Jesus' very own holy family. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. This is the scripture focus verse, Matthew 12, 50. Our second principle. Your response to Jesus determines your eternal destiny. Your response to Jesus determines your eternal destiny. Jesus is the one who created all of us. He alone can promise and give us the rest we need. Unless we believe and accept his rest, we will never find rest in this world or the world to come. Again, Jesus alone offers eternal rest for our restless souls. We each make a choice about Jesus. And when we make a choice for him, we become part of his family, not just here on earth, but forever into eternity. Jesus promised to forgive and remove the weight of sin from everyone who turns to him in repentance. Choosing to repent and follow Jesus transforms someone's life on earth and affects their eternal destiny. If you have trusted Jesus for salvation, Jesus calls you a part of his family for eternity. The truth about Jesus leads some people to believe in him while others refuse to believe. Every one of us has to make that choice. Even indifference is a choice. It's a choice against Jesus. Only the choice to believe in him leads to a life of joy and rest on earth in addition to an eternity with him. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, ladies, let me pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord. Amen to your word, Lord. We just are so grateful. Lord, thank you for filling our hearts with your word, Lord. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that abides in all who believe in you. Lord, for those that have unbelief, Lord, prick their hearts, Lord, and let your disciples go out, Lord, to just spread the gospel of Christ. Lord, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that your mercies are new every morning. And 
I give you all the praise, all the honor, in Jesus' name, amen.